The Great Steppe, millenniums of events, hundreds of nomadic tribes and people. They lived, worked, made discoveries, conquered large tracts of lands, and left us some mysteries. To learn more about it, watch the project called Enigma of the Great Steppe. The wanderings these two men undertook at first glance were a common thing. They were usual for any steppe person, whether he was a simple herder or a prince. People had their own motives to do it. But what pushed these two men to vagabond? Anyone who met them on their way would instantly know that these two men were not hermits, soldiers of fortune or restless tramps, but royalty. These noble wanderers had lands and dependent clans in their possession, and they both had a powerful common enemy. But it wasn't the war they were joining, neither it was a military campaign they were coming back home from, and still, they opted for a life full of dangers and adventures. What did they hope to find eventually? Secret knowledge? Fame? The truth? The answer to this question is blowing in the wind, the wind that was overhearing conversations of these two unusual travelers. The numerous Kyrgyz, Kazakh people live in unlimited freedom in comparison with the Kalmyks, who have to obey many small rulers. Each Kyrgyz, Kazakh, lives like a free man. However, each generation has a master to whom all descendants of this generation show voluntary obedience. Those who have a large number of subordinates are called Hans and Sultans. There are many Hans in our domestic historiography. Among them, two stand out. They lived in the 15th century. Both participated in certain important historical processes. However, the majority of Kazakh people discovered their names only quite recently. Today, any school kid knows who Kare and Janibek Hans were, and that six centuries ago, they became the founders of the Kazakh Hanat. Although, despite owning the status of the founding fathers of the first Kazakh state, they still remain semi-mythical figures. Everything was documented in European and even Russian history. Everything was written down, even the smallest details. What he ate for breakfast or lunch, who poisoned who, and what food the poison was in. For example, he ate a salad and died, and this all was documented. But we do not have such information. The nomads did not care about writing down their own history. They lived and enjoyed their life as it was. We say that in the years 1465 to 1466, According to European chronology, the Kazakh Hanat was formed. But how did it happen? Did someone adopt the constitution or held an inauguration? We do not know this. Someone may have raised Khans on a white felt, as it was customary back then. But who and whom? They raised one of them or both? We don't have information on this at all. Blank spaces in the history of two rulers are the real challenge for researchers and an opportunity to fantasize for those distant from science. So, who they were, sultans or hans? What was the reason of their row with Abu Khair? Why some believe they were rebels while others say they were exiles? And what Uzbeks and Sparta have to do with this? Everything we know about Jani Biek and Kire so far is limited to the works of Central Asian authors of the 16th to 17th centuries. Both Genghis Hids were descendants of Urus Khan, ruler of eastern Desht i Kipchak. Its capital was Signak. The remains of the settlement have been preserved at the territory of modern Kislorda region. Kire's grandfather, Toktakiya was the Han of Signak for a short period of time after Urus Khan died. And Janibek's grandfather, Kurchuk, ruled in Signak too. He even managed to rule in Sarai with the assistance of Amir Timur, who annexed the city in 1395. It was running in their blood. Their fathers, grandfathers, grand grandfathers ruled as Hans too. It might be that steppe princes were born in Signak. Maybe yes, and maybe no. When exactly were they born? It is a mystery too. What we have is only some indirect evidence stating that Kire was a little bit older than Janibek. 
If you are a Genghis Khid, then you become a sultan from the day you were born. It is a title that was acquired from birth. Sometimes historians say that initially they were sultans, then the Hanat was established and so they became Khans, but that is not correct. Surprisingly, but they became Khans before they established the Kazakh Hanat. They were Khans in their Uluses. It wasn't the Kazakh Hanat, those were Uluses. So what happened next? These two Khans were ruling in their Uluses, but we can't say exactly where their lands were or where these Uluses were located. We simply don't have sufficient information. In 1428, in the Tura region, Western Siberia, a 17-year-old Genghis Hid was proclaimed Han. His name was Abul Khayyir. Later, his policy will affect the nomads living in the territory of modern Kazakhstan. It is important to say that at the times of Kire and Zhanibek, one part of the Kazakh steppe was called Eastern Dishit Kipchak, or Uzbek Ulus, whereas the other was called Mogolistan. In the 1430s to 1440s, Abu Khair's power increased. He was gradually expanding his territory from the western Siberia to central Kazakhstan. Then he realized that it was beneficial to raid Khorezm and other rich Sir Darya cities. So he was expanding, he engaged in military campaigns. Eventually he settled in these cities and in the Sir Darya region. He made Signak his capital city. At the same time, Hans, Kire and Janibek, who witnessed the increase of his power and understood that they couldn't possibly fight against him, decided to move. They abandoned their lands and left. It is believed that Kire and Janibek were oppressed by Abu Khayyir Khan, and after their resentment of his oppression grew, they decided to leave, leading a great number of their people to the territory of modern Zhitisu, then Mogolistan. However, there are writings called Tari i Abu Khayyir Khani and Shaibani Nameh that tell us the story of Abu Khayyir Khan. And these writings list down the names of all his subordinates everyone he ruled, Batirs and Sultans. And there is neither Kire nor Janibek in these lists. Back then, Abu Khayyir Khan ruled in dish i Kipchak. He caused a lot of trouble to the Sultans of Jochi's descent. Janibek Khan, along with Kire Khan, escaped from him to Mogolistan. Isan Buga Khan welcomed them and granted them the regions of Chu and Koji Bashi, which made up the western part of Mogolistan. For some reason, people believe it was some kind of a great migration, that Kire and Janibek led a group of frustrated people. On the contrary, Muhammad Haidar wrote that only few people joined them. Mahmoud ibn Vali said that Kire and Janibek were joined by a small group of respectable people. It was Kire and Janibek's way of fighting the battle, to leave, to retreat, and not so many people in the steppe were aware of this move. And here we are approaching the most puzzling part of the history of two Hans. What was this mysterious migration, the one that so many people still speculate about? According to the tradition of that time, people who abandoned their ancestral lands and roamed around were called the Cossacks. Cossack is a Turkish word for a free person. It has long existed in the language of Turkic nomads, dating back to the 11th century. Beginning from the Kipchak era, this term was considered a social one. Any person could leave their lands, usually these were Hans or princes. Ordinary people were never mentioned in the chronicles. There was no point in mentioning them. Their lives were never described in the records. Usually when a prince or a warlord was leaving to Rome, it was said that this prince has become a Cossack. While he was young, he was gaining authority in his campaigns, proving he could fight with his prowess and courage. 
Then he would come back from his Cossack adventures to become a Han. As for Kire and Janibek, their fate was to remain Cossacks. If we cast a glance at the history of this word, we will find the Cossacks at many places and at different periods of times. The Hungarian Turkologist Mihai Dobrovich once mentioned that people who lived at the shore of Lake Balaton and left their tribe were all single. Even if the word Cossack itself has not necessarily been used in relation to those Hungarians, nevertheless, the very characteristics of those Hungarian Cossacks, Ukrainian Brodniks, or Ukrainian or Russian Cossacks, or Kazakh Cossacks, had some things in common. First and foremost, they were all vagabonds. Secondly, they all were young people. And thirdly, all of them were bachelors. This kind of phenomenon could be easily traced all the way back to ancient Sparta. Many would remember a funny children's game called the Cossacks Robbers. It is quite possible that it was an echo of the days when certain people encountered adventurous Kire and Janibek in the steppe. For a sedentary resident, the Cossacks were considered robbers, people who rob for living, whereas for nomads, Cossack lifestyle meant a period of wandering in the lives of noble men. The chronicles are blatant about this. Muhammad Shaibani followed a Cossack lifestyle for a couple of years. So did Kire, Janibek, and the others. Even Babur was a Cossack at some point, too. For people coming from steppe background, the word Cossack wasn't an equivalent of robbery. It was a way of surviving in the steppe. Some scholars argue that the Cossack lifestyle was based on things that were practiced by ancient people. In primitive times, this phenomenon was supposed to symbolize the transition of a man from one condition or status to another. In order for a person to change his status, he had to go through the initiation process. The initiation process allowed a person to become an equal member of society. In order to undergo this process, young men had to leave their tribes and hunt wild animals. They were scouting, watching the surroundings, and they had to warn their fellow tribesmen about approaching enemies. They had to fight those enemies, and most importantly, they had to perform some sort of feat, kill a wild animal, kill an enemy, or simply act courageously. Now we can say that in different places of Europe and Eurasia, people who passed these tests were called a certain word. And in the Turkic community, and apparently in the East Slavic too, such people were called Cossacks. So when did the Genghis Hid's forced freedom end? What did archaeologists discover in the places supposedly related to the nomadic movements of Kazakh Hans? And how did Kire and Janibek manage to jointly rule in their lands? Since at the beginning of their arrival in Magolistan, they were raiding in Kalmaks and robbing the outskirts of the regions, the name Cossack stuck to these people. The nomads from the Uzbek Ulus who were roaming the steppe of Zhitisu were called Uzbek's Cossacks. It is believed that these were not just disparate groups dissatisfied with the policies of Abu Khair, but groups of tribes and clans. The works of Kazakh scholars Shakarim Kudai Berdiev, Muhammad Jan Tinishpaev, and others include the collection of folk tales about that period. The most famous one is about the Karakipchak Koblandi Batir. He led the army of Abul Khair Khan. According to the legend, the Batir killed Khan's advisor in a duel. He was a compatriot of Janibek and Kere. They demanded the head of Koblandi. But Abu Khair objected, and as a result, Genghis Hids, along with their entire clans, migrated. If we look at the historical figures that were involved in this epos, 
We can see that all of them lived in the second half of the 15th, the beginning of the 16th centuries. After the foundation of the Kazakh Khanate. That's why this information should be treated as a legend rather than some concrete historical event. Apparently, there was some discontent since these people joined the migration. Even if it was 200,000 people, 100,000 people, they joined and they left. And there were other people who later joined two Hans, and due to which the expansion of the Kazakh Khanate happened. Apparently, after all, not everything was so well in Abul Khayr's Khanate. In 1468, Abul Khayr Khan started his military campaign. But the battle with the descendants of Uruz Khan never took place. The man suddenly died. The forced immigration of Kire and Jani Bek Khans ended. They not only managed to regain their original lands, but also seized the supreme power in the Uzbek Ulus, destroyed part of their rivals, and drove them away. In the meantime, something more important was happening in the domestic history. And this new territory was called the land of Kazakhs. They lost the word Uzbek and were called Kazakhs. Thus, this social term that was used to indicate free people started to gain a political meaning and later an ethnic meaning because all people were becoming Kazakhs. And the other thing, as the Kazakhs have always been free people, in the 15th century, in the 16th century, even when the Russians came here in the 17th to 18th century, it was always said that the Kazakhs did not obey anyone. They were always living a free life. And the fact that they were leading a free lifestyle and did not obey the Hans and Sultans characterized them as Cossacks or Kazakhs. My teacher, a famous historian orientalist, Klavdia Ivanovna Pishulina, were saying that Uruz Khan's white horde of the 14th century was his first Kazakh Hanat. These were the same Kazakhs, it was the same territory, the same population, language, and culture. Everything we attribute to the nation, all of it was identical to the Kazakh people. The only difference was that these people didn't call themselves as the Kazakhs just yet. A couple of clans which later joined those people were missing too. The event like the migration of 1459 was neither the beginning nor the apotheosis of the formation of the Kazakh nation. But it was one of the major milestones of that process. In 1459, the historical encounter of the developing nation and its name took place in the steppes of Zhitisu. How did the return of the wanderers, Genghis Hids, look like? Did any kind of triumphal ceremony take place? We can only speculate on this subject. By the way, historians have a version regarding what symbols of power Kire and Janibek Hans could possess. The Kazakh Hanat was the successor to Jochi Ulus. And the Crimean Hanat, the Kasim Hanat, and the Kazan Hanat were also the successors of Jochi Ulus. So if they had certain attributes and symbols of power, then the Khans of the Kazakh Khanat should have had them too. Basing my theory on this information, I analyzed the sources. In particular, I paid attention to such symbols of power as the throne and crown, Tat and Taj. The Kazakh folklore confirms that the Kazakhs had these things too. The traditions associated with Ablai confirm that he had his own throne and the crown, Taj, on his head. Not only Kazakh folklore proves this, but some other sources too. In particular, a Tatar researcher Ishakov wrote about this, based on the materials from the Kazan and Crimean Hanats. And there is also some information about this in written sources from Iran. That essay mentioned that Kasim Khan used to sit on his throne, and that he had a crown worth 70 tumans that was very expensive. According to researchers, the fact that both names of Kire and Janibek have reached us proves that they were co-rulers. 
Unfortunately, we cannot say exactly which of them was older. Kirei's grandfather, Toktakia, was, let's say, older. But does it mean that Kirei was older than Janibiak? We can trace this fact only hypothetically. We have no evident data on who and when they got married or who was born. They were about the same age, about 30 to 40 years old, when they acceded to the throne. They could have been very good friends, but this was not a guarantee that everything's going to be smooth, because they still shared some common interests. And here we can say that there was a two-wing system, and one part of the Khanat was ruled by Kirei Khan, the other by Janibiak. However, Kirei was still considered the eldest. In the sources, Janibiak is mentioned as Kishi Janibiak, the youngest Janibiak, and is said that Janibiak helped Kirei in everything, and that after the death of Kirei, he supported his son Burunduk. Janibiak outlived Kirei, but he never sat on the throne of the senior Han. Later, Janibiak's grandson completed the formation of the state within the borders of present-day Kazakhstan. All subsequent Kazakh rulers were the descendants of Janibiak. The people's memory has preserved the names of the Kazakh Hans and toponyms. Not far from the capital of modern Kazakhstan, there are lakes called Kirei and Janibiak. Recently, archaeologists were excavating the area near the banks of one of the lakes, and there they discovered something interesting. In 2009-2010, to 2010, for the first time in the territory of Sari Arka, south of our capital, we excavated the mausoleum of the 14th to 15th centuries, which was located on the shore of the Janibek Shalkar Lake. And the fact that during the excavations we discovered a majolica, a terracotta, that once covered the walls of this building, indicates that this mausoleum belonged to some famous or significant historical figure. I want to say right away that the mausoleum itself was not preserved, and we should not think that it is still there, because it is the Korgaljin steppe, the territory where Virgin Land's campaign was ongoing for 30 years. We also should keep in mind that in the Soviet era, the cult monuments were not of interest for anyone. It was discovered by chance on the 1st of September, 2009, when the hunting season started and hunters were digging a trench on the shores of the lake, when they discovered these colored majolica tiles. The Janibek Shalkar Lake is located on the territory of the Korgaljin Nature Reserve. It is a place to where pink flamingos migrate in springs. What if the Kazakh Hans used to admire this site too? Archaeologist Maral Khabdulina hypothesized that the steppe zone of Sariarka could be the patrimonial territory of the founders of the Kazakh Hanat. I want to emphasize that we did not find the central grave. The floor is completely covered with bricks. We did not want to break it, but we removed several bricks in the center and tried to see something. We did not find the grave, but there were two so-called opening graves outside the walls of this mausoleum, right at its entrance. At least that is what archaeologists say. These are the graves that were dug much later. They literally cut through a part of the floor and buried a man there. We examined one of those graves, then we closed it, left it like that. Why did we do this? Because we need some new ways of finding the central grave. Perhaps the entrance was located outside the walls. There might be an underground corridor and an underground chamber where a person was buried. But in any case, if you make a DNA or radiocarbon analysis of those bone residues, you can roughly imagine in what century or in what years these opening burials were made. Leaving their homeland, these two people were hopeful that one day they would come back. The odds are against them today. It is bitter to realize that the land of the ancestors and the capital of the Ulus went to their powerful rival, whereas them, the legitimate rulers, were turned into exiles. The free step welcomes everyone. 
they have an opportunity to surrender to the will of chance, get lucky again, and go on this way.